Hello, fellow members of the Midnight Society. Welcome back to another episode review from the show Are You Afraid of the Dark? Last time, we covered the tale of the final wish, a Kristen story about a young girl whose obsession with fairy tales leads to an unhappy ending. Tonight's narrative, from Frank, is about some theater employees who make a questionable bargain to save their old movie house. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I call this Season 2, Episode 2, The Tale of the Midnight Madness. We open on a POV shot of someone who appears to be sneaking up on Gary and Betty Ann at the campfire, but then it quickly cuts to show Kristen approaching with firewood. She's then cut off by Kiki and David, who are in a hurry to go to Fright Night at the Majestic Theater. Wait, Fright Night? Gary asks what's playing, and Kiki says, Who cares? Let's go. Then why are you here? Like, I'm not sure how the meetings are arranged, but surely a phone call would have solved a lot of problems. Gary! Gare! Gare Bear! About tonight. Uh, uh... Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, I I know you told me to stop calling you that. Um, but, but hey, listen. About tonight, I got some free passes to Fright Night at the Majestic Theater, right? So what do you say that we all go watch some scary movies instead of sitting around a campfire telling dumb, scary stories? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Gary? Gare? Gare Bear? I think he hung up. Frank arrives and says he's been to Fright Night. Okay, I'm going to need everyone to just stop saying Fright Night. <laughs> I am getting really thirsty. Welcome. Right night. Anyway, Frank says he's never going back. When asked why, Kiki reminds everyone that Frank is afraid of the dark. Uh, okay, okay, T time out, time out. All right, it's debatable how frightened of the dark Frank actually is, since Eric was being a D-bag that episode and turned out to be the one who was really afraid of the dark. Oh, Eric. Is it weird that I miss him? Frank says he isn't returning to Fright Night because you sit in the theater so long you forget the real world exists. What the hell are you talking about, Frank? I've sat through an entire MCU marathon at a theater and didn't piss myself when Thanos snapped his fingers thinking he might have ruined my chances at catching Scarlet Witch on the rebound. And look, but before you all judge me, okay? She was vulnerable and I could have been there for her and gotten myself out of the friend zone. Frank says the only thing that seems real is the horror movie on the screen, which makes Kiki and David look at each other like they both sat on something fairly uncomfortable. The tale begins on the outside of the Rialto movie theater, playing the Bostics of Beacon Hill, which got me curious, but no, it's not a real movie, at least that I could find, uh, which I guess explains why we see only the end title card of the black and white film. The camera then pans around to reveal one single old person in the theater clapping at the movie. We meet our main character, Pete, who works at the theater. He asks the old woman if she enjoyed the film, to which she maturely replies, Then why were you clapping? I mean, it was slow clapping, so maybe it was meant to be sarcastic, and I suppose you could argue that she grew up in a time where being polite was of the utmost importance, but then how do you explain... Pete's co-worker Katie approaches, saying that they should go because the theater is depressing. Pete tells her that he has to clean the aisles first. You mean the aisle, Pete? <laughs> Who am I looking to for affirmation? There's no one here. We then meet Mr. Kristoff, the theater's manager who's complaining that they only made six dollars in concessions. Katie says that they sold one popcorn and two sodas. Oh, how I miss the days when even just one of those items cost less than six dollars. Hey, that's seven bucks, buddy. For a coke? The theater is in such a sad state that it wasn't even the guest that bought the sodas. It was Pete. Mr. Kristoff says that Friday is supposed to be a good night, and Katie says that $6 is a good night. Shouldn't he know how poorly the theater's doing? I get the impression that it's been in this state for a while, so why is he surprised at poor concession sales? He's also struggling to take the cash drawer out of the register, but come on. It's $6. Do you really need to take the whole drawer to close it out? Pete shows up at the front counter with his two drink cups, and Katie says the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. If we can reuse these. I'm sorry, you want to reuse Pete's drink cups for future guests? No wonder your theater's failing. I mean, I'm not saying that what she's proposing has never been done before, but I don't like seeing behind the curtain. Pete asks Katie if she'd like to get something to eat, but she shuts him down pretty quickly. Oh, no, I got homework. Hey, <laughs> I get it, Pete. I was in the same place with Wanda. I, of course, she 
She actually prefers that I, I call her Scarlet Witch, so. We cut to a couple of shots of Pete trying to save the theater by putting up and handing out flyers. This scene is immediately followed up with... Okay, I just think this lady doesn't like movies. And that is not a trash receptacle. I mean, unless Katie started putting up We Reuse Popcorn and Drink Cup signs. Uh, wait, she didn't, did she? We cut to another day when Pete and Katie arrive at the theater to start setting up for the night. Katie asks how Pete's Save the Theater campaign is going, and he tells her not well. Apparently, he tried to get landmark status for the theater, but he claims that it won't be easy. Shouldn't getting landmark status and trying to drive business to the theater be the job of, oh, say, the manager, or the owners, or anyone other than Pete the Passionate Usher? What's your angle, pal? While Pete and Katie are talking, the ominous shadow of Hagrid approaches the front door to the theater. Katie is expressing her lack of faith in the theater's future when a knock is heard at the door. Pete shouts that the theater doesn't open for another hour, which causes the door to start rattling as though someone's trying to force their way in. Pete approaches the door and repeats for whoever's out there to come back in an hour, but then this happens. Pete and Katie look concerned, but barely. I would have been back at the concession stand, on the phone with emergency services, immediately. But then again, I like living. You have chosen wisely. The theater doors open, and a person steps in with a wide-brimmed hat on, but looking at the ground to obscure their face. Who enters a room like that? All right, just keep looking down, right? Hide your face for the mystery. Just like this, yes, yes, but... Wait, now I can't see. Did the, wait, did the door open? I mean, I've got the magics, but I've been looking down this whole time, so who knows? You know what? I'll just, I'll just walk forward, right? Even if I walk into the door, it's okay. It's not like anyone will see it if it's closed. So I'll just, I'll just take a few steps and reveal myself. Wait, what if there's no one there to see? Like, what if they're on the phone with emergency services right now because of the way I came pounding on the door? Boy, would that be embarrassing. Our mystery guest is revealed to be... Thinks the name, Dr. V. It's our first recurring character, who appeared in Frank's first story, The Tale of the Phantom Cab. We will see Vink and a few others appear in other stories throughout the series. The first time around, Vink was harvesting body parts from those that couldn't solve riddles, so I'm not sure what his game is now, but I know it can't be good. Vink is completely smitten with the old theater and brings that same crazy energy he did the first time he appeared. This frightens Katie, who wants to call the police, and... I mean, it's probably going to be the only smart inkling anyone has in this tale. Of course! While Vink is getting ready to make love to the theater, uh, Mr. Kristoff bursts in demanding to know what's going on. Vink tells Kristoff that he's there to save the theater and it won't cost him a dime. He says he used to be a filmmaker back before color and before sound and... I mean, if that doesn't give these theater employees pause, I don't know what will. I mean, at least Katie thinks he's a nutbag. And I am not a nutbag. Vink presents them with a film reel. He says it's a vampire movie that's unique because in his movie, the vampire wins. Vink promises Kristoff that if he shows his movie, people will flock to the theater and their fortunes will change for the better. Kristoff doesn't believe Vink, but Vink says he doesn't have to. Just show the movie and he'll see. All he asks for in return is that if the theater is successful, he be given one night a week, of Kristoff's choosing, mind you, to show his other films. I mean... That seems like a deal, but it's Vink, so his other movies are probably things like The Room and The Human Centipede. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Mr. Kristoff agrees to the terms and shakes Vink's hand, but the moment Vink is gone, he says, The guy's loony! Throw it out! Look, as crazy as the proposition sounds, you're already showing old black and white movies to one ill-tempered old lady. What could it hurt to screen a silent vampire movie just once to see if anything comes of it? Pete doesn't throw the movie out. He puts it in the projection booth and forgets about it, but continues on his quest to save the theater. Unfortunately, one Saturday night, Mr. Kristoff gets word that the theater will be closing in two weeks. That same night, the reel for the film that was showing breaks during the screening. Rather than send people home and give out refunds, Pete puts Dr. Vink's movie on, which apparently was so good that it has the following effect on the theater's best customer. No more classics like that, kid, and you might get a couple more customers. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. Vampire movies are sexy to people of all ages, and... I feel like I... I feel like I have to...
Pete and Katie are so excited that the movie's a hit that they hug. And then, you know, Pete cheapens the mood. Let's hug again! <laughs> Dude, could you be any more desperate? Uh, hey Wanda, I mean... I mean, Scarlet Witch. <laughs> uh, it's me. Again. Back at the Midnight Society, Frank relays how Dr. Vink's movie was a hit and stopped the Rialto from closing, just as he said it would. While he shares this, everyone else chows down on popcorn, and... Nope. Nope, I'm calling shenanigans, okay? Where did all the popcorn and the popcorn tubs come from? Gary and Betty Ann were already at the campsite when everyone else arrived. Kristen approached with firewood, Kiki and David had nothing, and Frank had a backpack. Now, it would stand to reason that Frank brought the popcorn because it was his story that was movie-themed, but there is no way that his thin backpack held those tubs and popcorn for everyone. I'm sorry, Frank. I'm just, it's not your fault. I'm just bitter now because I want popcorn. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Back in the story, we see a packed crowd watching the end of the vampire movie, which is clearly an homage to the 1922 film Nosferatu, with the twist being that the vampire wins instead of being killed by sunlight as he is in the original film. The movie concludes with an enthusiastic applause from the audience. As the theater empties out, Pete and Katie revel in the theater's success, and, you know, since Pete can't take a hint, he asks Katie out again, but is interrupted by the arrival of Dr. Vink, who actually chooses to walk through the door with his head up this time around. Pete tells Vink how successful the theater's been, when Mr. Kristoff shows up and starts hanging on Vink like they're dating. Uh, he too also expresses how well the theater's doing, and says it's time to make a deal for Vink's film. Vink says that they already have a deal, and reminds Kristoff of the terms. Now, being the upstanding douchebag that Kristoff is, he says he can't show Vink's other movies, because the theater is just too busy. Uh, Frank, just so we're clear, th this guy dies at the end, yeah? You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? Kristoff offers Vink money for his film, which he doesn't want, so he responds hostily. I don't want your money. I don't want your friendship. Kristoff responds even more aggressively, resulting in... <laughs> That's why you're wrong, my friend. Look, I don't know how they do things in Canada, but if you're in a heated exchange with someone, and they break into a sinister laugh while making vague threats... That's when you apologize and offer them two nights a week for their movies. I'll give you three nights plus a cut of the vending. Also, if this man said his movie would bring the business, and then it did, why would you deny him one night a week of your choosing to show his other movies? Kristoff may be the dumbest person to appear in a story yet. <laughs> yeah. We get some voiceover from Frank that the Rialto continued to do well as a result of Vink's movie, and that Pete wanted to study the film to find out what made it so good. Unfortunately, while watching the film one night to take notes, Pete starts to nod off and doesn't see the vampire step out of the screen. I mean, probably for the best. Otherwise, that aisle would need a thorough cleaning. Pete tells Katie that he just had a weird dream about Nosferatu stepping out of the movie. Wait, what? He yawned, closed his eyes, and then when he opened them, the screen was blank as though the movie ended. Either someone cut that weird, or he actually had a dream about the vampire coming out of the screen. We get a POV shot of something moving silently down the hall towards Kristoff's office. Meanwhile, Pete takes another shot at telling Katie he likes her, and she says that she likes him too. Oh, I see how it is. When the theater was going under, it was all, I have homework, but now that it's a success, it's all, let's make out behind the concession stand. You can't toy with people's emotions, Wanda. I mean, Katie? I might have some issues to work out. Before Pete and Katie can kiss, they hear Kristoff scream. They rush to his office to find him slumped over his desk with two puncture marks on his neck. Pete tries to call an ambulance, but the phone isn't working. It's, it's dead. No way. If I'm being honest, Katie missed an opportunity to beat CSI to the punch here. It's, it's dead. That's not the only thing dead around here. Pete and Katie try to leave the theater, but find the doors locked. Pete is positive it's Dr. Vink's doing. The doors suddenly open, revealing the vampire. Pete and Katie flee to the storage closet, where Pete has a nervous break? No! Yes! Maybe. I don't know. Just as when Vink first arrived, the door magically unlocks itself, forcing the young pair to run to the projection room, where Pete gets an idea. He tells Katie to cue up the last reel of the film, and he makes for the stage, getting intercepted by the vampire along the way. He's just about to be an early evening snack when Katie calls down that she's ready. 
For some reason, this completely draws the vampire's attention, and he goes after her. Maybe it's her perfume that's driving all the fellas crazy for her. <laughs> I said smell me. The vampire arrives at the projection room, and we learn two things. One, based on his fangs, this isn't Nosferatu, but his hillbilly cousin. And two, if you're going to suck the life out of someone, do it quickly. He takes so long to attack Katie that she manages to turn on the projector, which causes him to run away? Guy, this is the second meal you've passed up on for no reason. Are you just full on Kristoff? I mean, he was a husky meal. Down in the theater, Pete steps into the movie through the screen. While he's in there, the vampire comes after him, but Pete manages to pull the curtain away from the window, allowing sunlight to pour in and kill old Nosferatu. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you board up the windows from the outside! What a noob! Pete comes back into the real world and it's revealed that Kristoff is still alive. Really, Frank? You couldn't just give me that one? Hey, excuse me for adding a little fuel to the fire. We then hear the cackle of Dr. Vink, who says what a good show it all was. Clearly, Kristoff is nervous enough now that he offers to show Vink's movies, but Vink reveals that he has purchased the theater and can now show his movies every night from now on, stating, I've got many, many more that are far better than this one. Vink's just misunderstood. He's just an artist looking for a place to display his work. And if I may quote the prolific director, James Cameron, what's a few bodies on the way to greatness? I don't know that he actually said that. Anyway, the story ends with Frank asking who still wants to go to Fright Night. Kiki and David have turned into chickens all of a sudden and give their movie passes to Frank. Gary questions him about it since Frank said he was never going back and Frank answers, You kidding? It's just a movie. And I got two free passes. Wait, this whole story was just to score some free movie tickets? Well played, Frank. Well played. Piece of cake. Now for the review. I feel like this episode was solid all around with a few hiccups. A strong concept with decent acting, makeup, and atmosphere. The idea of a horror movie coming to life is a terrifying one, and one that I can relate to. When I was a wee lad, I fell asleep watching a horror movie, only to wake up on the couch, in the dark, alone. Shadows down the hall had me convinced that the creature from the TV had escaped and was coming after me. Uh, I'd also like to point out that there were adults on that couch with me when I was awake, and they left my ass there to wake up in terror because they were bad parents. What is this, campfire therapy? Just as Dr. Vink predicted. The empty theater lends itself well to setting the mood. Old buildings always have that vibe of like it's definitely haunted, though this one does look more like a community theater than a historic movie house. The makeup in the episode was both good and bad. When the vampire was in the black and white movie, it looked really, really good. In fact, a lot of care was given to that whole fake movie. Someone had a real love of the original film, and it shows. However, when the vampire steps into the real world, the makeup is just awful in my opinion. I think if they would have gone with a grayscale makeup so that it looked like the vampire was still black and white in a color world, it would have been more effective. Everybody's a critic. The sound and music in the episode was great. They really captured the feel of the silent film with the Nosferatu movie, and the music set the right amount of tension in all the scenes interacting with the vampire and Dr. Vink. Perfect! Absolutely perfect! While I wasn't too invested in the characters, Pete and Katie are likable enough that you want them to succeed in saving the theater. That being said, I didn't get the usual sense of enjoyment that I do from a grim ending, and I'm not sure if that's because I wasn't invested or due to the vagueness of Vink's intentions. Younger me wouldn't have found this episode scary, but he would have signed a deal with Dr. Vink if it meant he could physically go into old movies. The acting in this episode was good. Uh, I won't say great, but by Are You Afraid of the Dark standards, it was good. Pete was goofy in just the right way, you believed his passion for saving the theater, and he had some great awkward moments interacting with Katie. Katie didn't have much of a character, and was there more to give Pete someone to interact with, but she does the best with what she's given. Neither of them get to do much with the horror, but their fear does feel appropriate when it's there. <coughs> the adult actors are really where the episode shines. Kristoff is a great counter to Pete and Katie. He's over the top and obnoxious in a way that makes you want to see bad things happen to him. I mean, he's, he doesn't come across evil or anything, just punchable. <laughs> Make jokes. Uh, Dr. Vink brings that same scene-chewing menace that he did in The Tale of the Phantom Cab, and I can see why he's a recurring character. 
Frank, I am pleased to report that the tale of the Midnight Madness meets the approval of the Midnight Society. What did you all think of Frank's story? Did you see it as a kid? What were some of your favorite tales from the series? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to check out the next episode about the tale of Locker 22. Until next time, are you afraid of the dark? And I am not a nutbag. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and a share. Be sure to subscribe and click that bell icon to be notified when more Midnight Society episodes go up. And we've got a ton of other cool shows on the channel, so stick around. You might find something else that you like.